Really pleased to welcome onto stage our next speaker, Jonathan Blake, who is Technical Director of Crop Protection at ADAS. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Emily. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure, actually, to come here and present to you face to face. It's a pleasure not to be um, being upstaged by my dog this time. Um, I'd like to start by just giving you a brief introduction to the project. It's been primarily funded by AHDB over the years, um, but also has been delivered through a consortium, a group, a fungicide working group, uh, that is primarily led by ADAS, NIAB and SIUC, but also with Harper Adams and uh, Rothamsted Research, uh, providing technical support. I should also mention, though, the um, Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in Ireland has been uh, co-funding work at Chuggis, and those trials have been in parallel to what we've been doing in the UK and adding additional data to the overall data set. So that's been very useful. These pathogens have no respect for political borders. So it's quite useful to be able to draw information from other parts of the world. I should start actually by saying this project's been running for 25 years, sorry, 27 years. Actually, Neil Paverley started this back in 1994, uh, the appropriate dose network. Um, and it's been um, championing uh, independent information uh, on fungicides, uh, both with looking at efficacy, but also the appropriate dose. The first table here is just a, a list of all the products, actives, and modes of action that we've been testing uh, of late, and we'll be on some of the charts that we're going to share with you today. I'm not going to run you through all of them, but I will draw your attention to one or two. Um, for a start, right at the top, we have uh, Folpet. Folpet has a number of different product names. In these charts, we'll be primarily referring to it as Arizona. Um, you may notice other things, but that's what we will be talking about it as. One or two others that you may be less familiar with. Uh, third down on the top table there is Myresa. Myresa is actually Revisol. It's the active ingredient, Methentrifluconazole, the new azole that BASF launched a couple of years ago. Uh, it is available on its own as Myresa, well, probably more in a twin pack, uh, but it's also present in Revistar down here in combination with Floxaparoxa. The other one you might also be perhaps less familiar with, Pectiga. Pectiga is the, the, another solo product, straight fenpicoximid. This is the new QII fungicide that was launched last spring from Corteva. It's also perhaps more, more commonly known as Univoc. Uh, in Univoc, it's present with Protheoconazole. Both of those two are available, both Myresa and um, Pectiga are, uh, are registered as solo products. We're not actually advising that anybody uses them that way. And I think probably commercially, the only way you can get hold of them is in uh, a twin pack with a partner product. So uh, that's probably the way we should be using them in partnership with other modes of action. I've got a lot to cover, actually, because we're covering wheat, barley, and oilseed rape in a quite a short period of time today. I'm going to dive straight in and, and get into the Septoria data. Um, We've been testing Septoria uh, products at seven sites uh, for a few years now. Um, and across those seven sites that tend to be located in the higher risk parts of the country, um, either in the west of England, Scotland, or in Ireland. Uh, and we tend to test over a range of different spray timings. It tends to give us a good spread of curative and protectant information. Um, and that strategy seems to have worked once again uh, from 2021 We've got six sites that provided us with good protectant data and four that gave us good curative as well. So that's, that's really encouraging. We've got a good, strong data set. I'll dive straight into the data now uh, and share the first of the several charts that look like this. Um, on the right-hand side here, we've got the products with a single active ingredient. On the left-hand side, we have the mixtures. You can compare left to right on these charts. It is the same data set. As you'll see within each of those lines, we're looking at quarter, half, full, and double rate. I believe actually those of you watching online may just have quarter, half, and full, because I think the graphs have been stretched to be naught to 100%. Uh, but actually, we like to share that up to 200% on platforms. It gives a bit more confidence in the line fit 
around that 100% dose. So that's quite good uh, from a confidence perspective. One product in here is tested just at a single dose. That's Arizona. We did this previously with chlorothalonil, Bravo. Uh, it's useful to have a multi-site protectant in these trials. It gives us an indication as to how well multi-site protectants are doing, but also how protectant an individual uh, leaf is in, in an individual trial. It can be a guide to help us determine uh, the curative or protectant element of uh, a result. So we have Arizona in there, and actually Arizona providing us with something in the order of 30% control, reducing septoria from about 22% uh, percent on average across the, the site, down to about 15 about 30% somewhere in there, percent control. Two other products quite close to Arizona at a full label rate, uh, Proline and Intrex. Intrex looking a fraction stronger than Arizona in a protectant scenario uh, at a full label rate. Proline actually, on average, looking a little bit behind that uh, last year. Of the solo products, we've also got Myresa in here. That's the Mefen trifluconazole we mentioned a moment ago. The solo uh, azole. And clearly that's performing very, very well on Septoria uh, in a protectant scenario and better than we had the performance we've seen from Protheoconazole of late. Looking at the mixtures on the left-hand side, reassuringly the two mixtures are both performing very, very well as well. Um, and probably very hard to separate them based on that data. You'd say those uh, performing very similarly. We look at curative data from 2021. Uh, four sites here now. Everything tends to perform less well in a curative situation. And that's exactly what we see. And actually, Intrex and Proline not providing a huge amount of curative activity last year. My research certainly looking better. Uh, and Univoc and Revistar, again, uh, almost inseparable there in terms of their activity. Be careful here when you're interpreting curative data, though. Um, there is often uh, numerous infection events that will have occurred on these leaves prior to them being sprayed. In many occasions, they have a level of septoria that's beyond control. So there may well be at the bottom here 10, 15 percent, but just no fungicide will control. It may actually even be visual symptoms when that leaf is sprayed. So it's not an absolute value. It's more a measure of how um, products compare. In protectant scenarios, we, we think we can look at that a little bit more closely because, of course, we're looking at leaves that have just emerged or are emerging at time of spray application. Just looking at yields, uh, remember, of course, yields are a fairly atypical um, measure in these trials. We wouldn't normally go out into a crop and spray once and then just let that treatment run, but that's what we do. We only spray once. Um, so it's a fair test, of, it's a tough test of persistence. Uh, and broadly, though, we see a, a similar pattern to what we've just seen in terms of disease control, just the inverse. And on the right-hand side, uh, you can certainly see that with my research performing quite well uh, and looking like giving a yield response larger than we saw from Intrex and Proline there. On the left, Univoc and Revistar, a little bit of a separation there perhaps in terms of yield. And I think that might reflect um, the persistence that we saw from Univoc. It did seem to hold up better right at the end of the season last year, but both performing very well. We, of course, also can look over seasons, and uh, this can be quite valuable to improve and strengthen the data. Um, so this is actually protecting data over three seasons now, uh, 2019 to 21, um, 16 trials in total. A very similar pattern. Actually, everything looks a bit better when you look over that three-season average. I think that partly is because it was a tough protest last year in the protectant scenario. A lot of late infection events that would have challenged uh, products uh, that were applied sometime prior to those infection events occurring. Um, but, um, and 2020 was the opposite, uh, a much easier protectant scenario and everything performed very well. But you can see you know, products giving us around 50% control include Arizona, Intrex and Proline and the mixtures. And now you'll see on the left-hand side, we have got Ascara in here. We didn't test it last year, but we did test it in the previous two years. And if we have a product in trials for more than uh, half of the, well, more than half the trials that we're including in the data set include a product, we can include it in the data. And that's why Ascara creeps in here. Um, and yes, uh, over the three-year average in a protective situation, Revistar and Univoc look very, very similar. 
dose for dose, you'd say Asker is just a little bit of a step behind there. Looking at the curative data over three seasons, a very similar pattern. Again, the lines tend to straighten. That just reflects the fact that we don't tend to see uh, a sharp shoulder. We don't seem to see a leveling off at a half label rate uh, when we're looking at curative scenarios. It tends to be the more you apply, the more curative activity you get. Um, it's not really, really where we want to be, actually. We prefer to be in a protectant scenario. We tend to get better efficacy. Uh, and yes, uh, Intrax and Proline over a three-year average, not providing us with a huge amount of curative activity, but the mixtures containing the new modes of action certainly are looking quite strong. And again, Ascara, um, somewhere between a little bit off the pace in a curative scenario compared to the new products when con compared dose for dose. And in terms of yield, it's almost an inverse of what we've just seen, a very similar pattern uh, with uh, Univoc and Revistar uh, looking similar on that data, probably over on the three-year average, just give it to, to Univoc. So that concludes the sort of sectoria. I'll go on to other diseases in a moment. Before we do, I just wanted to touch on how azoles and SDHIs and SDHI azoles have changed over time. It's quite important to, to get some feel for where things are relative to where they've been. Um, and um, this just shows the activity that we've seen from protheoconazole over the years. This is from a full dose of protheoconazole applied in a protectant situation. Um, and back in 2001, 2002, we're getting 80 to 100% control or 90% control from a full label rate of protheoconazole. It was working incredibly well. And gradually over a period of time, its activity has declined. We do see variation from one season to the next. There are some years, like 2010, it looked quite weak suddenly. Uh, but then you will always get some variation around the mean and any, any individual site will throw some strange results. 2021, the data point that we've added for this year, uh, clearly was um, yeah, quite a tough test. And we saw very poor control actually from protheoconazole when applied alone in a protectant scenario in these trials. I have added one additional point here, mefentrifluconazole, the new azole from BASF. Clearly that's hard to see a trend yet because it's just a single point, but um, performing similarly to what we were seeing from Proline 10 or 15 years ago. We look at the SDHIs, we look at this in a slightly different way. This is a percent control graph. Here the bold lines represent the mean response in terms of percent control in each year. The dotted lines represent the highest and lowest response we saw in each of those years. Um, and you know, when you look back in at the SDHI Intrex back in 2016, 17, it was doing a fantastic job. It was giving us uh, either from a half or a full label rate, we were getting between 70 and 85 percent control. Um, gradually over a period of time, yes, we get some seasonal change, but this last year, at that half or full label rate of Intrex, we're giving us between 30 to 40 percent control. So doing approximately half of what it was doing four or five years ago. Clearly a change in efficacy there. And quite a range, actually, between sites. Um, yeah, at one site, it was actually performing very well. At another site, it was hardly giving us anything. So we are seeing it as a less, perhaps, uh, robust and reliable tool in the army. But it still is uh, adding to efficacy and, and still helping. Fortunately, the mixtures are still holding up quite well. Tough test last year, but it's quite hard, even with the tough test last year, to, to, to pick a decline in that. Um, and, you know, we've, we actually tracked back here. We've got Univoc and Revistar going right back to um, 2017 within trials. Of course, they, you know, they've been registered much more recently than that. Um, one thing to note, actually, um, when we initially looked at these products in 2017 to 19, of the two new products, you'd have picked Revistar ahead of Univoc there. And I think the one thing we've seen perhaps in the last couple of years is them perform very, very much more similarly, uh, much closer in terms of their activity. So that was it on Sectoria. I'm going to, want to talk about Yellow Rust now. Um, this is a trial that's done at ADAS Terrington. It was an interesting trial because it starts green, goes yellow, we spray it, it then goes patchy yellow and green. Um, and then back to yellow again quite quickly. Um, tough test. 
It's uh, up on the wash next to the coast, you get a lot of yellow rust, and we use a susceptible variety to maximize the chance of differences. Again, same design of trial. On the right hand side, you've got the products with a single active ingredient. Uh, Pectiga here, the solo fenpicoximid, clearly adding some activity on the other rust, but perhaps not quite as strong as some of the other single active modes of action there, uh, such as Myresa and Intrex. Note the two that actually come up probably best here uh, at the lowest dose rates uh, Alartis Plus and Proline, and both performing very well at a low dose. Actually, th those two are performing well. Uh, means that it's perhaps no surprise that Alartis, Alartis era on the left, which is just a combination of the red and light blue line there, uh, looks the strongest. The other two, Univoc and Revistar, well, they are a combination of the other partners within this uh, and actually come out almost identical in terms of their efficacy. So the mixtures tend to perform well on yellow rust, uh, but if you did have a specific yellow rust problem, I can see Alartis era may have a role to play. Looking at that over three years, a very similar pattern. I think this sort of reflects what we often say about yellow rust. It's not quite so much about product, but more about um, timing, or it's certainly it's a, as much about both those two factors. Um, again, though, you probably would just pick a lattice era as a little stronger than some of the others uh, on the mixture side. Yields can be an interesting test in such a trial. You know, a difference in duration of control by literally a week can make quite a significant difference in uh, the yield that we see. Um, quite hard to separate the products with a single active ingredient there, but you can see on the left-hand side, again, we picked out Alartis era in a pure yellow rust scenario. Alartis era is strong and will probably give you the best control of any of the STHI azoles that are out there. Um, Univoc, actually not far behind that, but perhaps a bit more difficult based on that data set to separate any of those uh, yield lines. There is some overlap between the points and uh, curves, and, and when you have that, it gives a little bit less confidence that you can properly separate things out. Moving on to look at brown rust, this is a trial over in Cambridge that uh, NIAB run, um, and um, yeah, using the variety Crusoe. On the left-hand side, Proline. Clearly Proline works very well on yellow rust, but actually less well on brown rust. We've known that for some years. Pectiga a little bit stronger than that, um, but Alatus Plus and Myresa, um, both very, very strong single active uh, products uh, on brown rust. Uh, and with that, it's perhaps no surprise that uh, Revistar, containing Myresa, of course, uh, looks very good as well. Uh, and that Univoc, given that it contains Pectiga and Proline, um, is better than uh, each of its components alone, but perhaps not quite as strong as Revistar on brown rust. Looking across three years, that's where we start to include Ascara again, it was in trials previously. And clearly, you know, when you look at the Proline line there uh, and compare it to the Ascara, the two STHIs in Ascara are doing a fantastic job at adding brown rust control uh, and reducing the amount of disease in these trials. Um, and yeah, I think the other products are sitting fairly similarly to what we've just seen, um, Intrex as well. and. Um, Benzo, Vindi, Flupi, those two STHIs also giving us very good control of brown rust. And in terms of yield, the picture's a bit noisy on yields from the brown rust, even over three sites, three seasons rather. Um, but I think it does pick, you can pick out Revistar perhaps as uh, being a little stronger than others uh, when, it looks, when you're looking at yield from brown rust trials. Um, and Myresa coming out strongest of the single active uh, products. That was it on wheat. I want to move on to talk about barley uh, and oilseed rape. And actually, we've got some new products to talk about within both of those two crops. Um, on barley, we've been looking at um, three main diseases, rhynchosporium, net blotch, and ramularia. And we've had what, three trials looking at ramularia, three at rhynchosporium, two at net blotch over the last year. And um, this is one of the additions. Um, you'll probably think, well, that's not really an addition. That's been around for ages. Ascara we've just spoken about in wheat has been available in wheat for, uh, for many years. It's now available in barley. It was registered at the end of the last season, I think it was in April or, or May last year. So some of you may have already used it. Uh, one thing to note, it has a different full label rate in barley to that that it has in wheat. In wheat, you can apply up to 1.5 liters for the hectare. In barley, it's 1.2. And you can only apply that 1.2 liters once, or rather you can apply it in more than one application, but a total dose of 1.2 is the limit. Um, 
How does that compare to what you've been using in Bali? Well, we've been using protheoconazole-based chemistry for a long time in Bali. Uh, I can give a comparison with Siltra. Uh, Siltra is a mixture of protheoconazole and bixofen. Uh, compared to Siltra, this contains a bit more SDHI. It's got a bit more bixofen in a full label rate of it, and it's got the addition of another SDHI in fluoropyram, but it's got a little bit less protheoconazole. So it's a more loaded towards the SDHI components. And we'll have a look and see what that brings. Uh, on Rhynchosporium, uh, this is the, the data that we've got. And it's a slightly different chart here, I should just explain. Um, we've got less lines, so we've actually um, put the protectant data on the left and the curative data or eradicant data on the right-hand side. Uh, and it's the same lines on both sides. Um, so you can't compare left to right in quite the same way now. Um, but... Um, when we look at the Rhynchosporium, proline is the, is the go-to benchmark, uh, and the light blue line of proline performing quite well. Um, Ascara, a little bit less protheoconazole, a little bit more SDHI, actually performing very similarly to proline uh, on Rhynchosporium there. Revistar, we, we know Intrex, floxapyroxad, has very good activity on Rhynchosporium, always has. Uh, and Revistar contains that, so it's no surprise that both those two are, are looking very strong as well. I'm looking at the curative data on the left-hand side, everything performing less well, as we always find. Um, and, um, yeah, a very similar pattern to what we've just explained from the protectant, I think. Looking at the yields, actually, the one thing that comes out when we look at yields on the Rhynchosporium trials is uh, the, the mixtures tend to come out a little bit better. That may be through uh, the control of some other diseases. Generally, we're, we're looking at pure uh, cases of, of individual diseases, though. Uh, and, yeah... Ascara and Revistar um, at the lower rates, looking a fraction stronger perhaps than uh, the solos of Intrex and Proline. Good case for using mixtures. Thinking about net blotch for a moment, this is um, some interesting data on Ascara here. We've got, we haven't got quite as much net blotch data. It's been a more difficult pathogen to, to catch in trials in recent years. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the protectant data we've got. And this is actually one trial from 2019. I've included that because we've got Ascara in there as well. We had it, we've had Ascara in these trials for a few years now. And actually, Kayak, we know Kayak, it will provide us in a protectant scenario, something between 30 and 50% control, um, and can be a useful additional addition to fungicide programs. Of course, Ciprodinil will also add a little bit of mildew activity, so it can be quite useful early season. I think it's probably impossible to separate any of those lines on the left-hand side, everything performing very well in the protectant scenario uh, on net blotch. On the right-hand side, we have got a bit of separation here. If we look at proline and then compare Ascara to it, the addition of those two SDHIs quite clearly is improving control of net blotch. So uh, we are seeing clear benefit there, I think, from uh, the role the product Ascara. The Revisar as well. Uh, and Intrex, performing quite similarly to Protheoconazole. And we see that same benefit actually come through in, in the yields from these NetBlotch trials. This is across six trials that we got yields from in, in over a three-year period. Um, and, yeah, the proline-based chemistry tending to, to, to perform very well in these trials. Uh, and, yeah, a clear separation, I think, between Ascara uh, and Proline there. Now, this is a trial where you can compare the left and right is the same data sets, the Ramularia data, um, and we haven't got a huge number of products on Ramularia at the moment. We've got Proline and Myresa on the left hand, on the right hand side, and Revistar on the right. Um, Proline provides a level of control against Ramularia; it's not very active. Um, Myresa is clearly more active than that. Uh, frustratingly, you actually have to apply quite a high dose of Myresa to get a good level of control of Ramularia. Um, it's no surprise, really, that Revistar uh, follows an almost identical response to what we see from Myresa there, primarily because it's the methane trifluconazole in both of those two that is driving that. We don't think the Intrex is adding much on Ramularia protectant, protection. So just to conclude on, on wheat and barley, uh, I think it's fair to say on Septoria, Univoc and Revistar, showing the highest level of activity. Um, we are seeing some changes in activity of SDHIs. Uh, 
uh, especially since about 2017, but, but also declines in azoles as well, particularly protheoconazole. Um, on yellow rust, uh, Alatus era was particularly effective, um, but I think all mixtures performed quite well. So there are a number of options. Uh, I think it's not many people will be farming in the same way as we're testing on yellow rust. Um, so I think probably practically there's quite a few choices there. Nefen trifluconazole and the SDHI is both very, very active on brown rust. Brown rust. Um, fenpicoximid and protheoconazole and brown rust adding useful activity, but perhaps not quite as strong as those others. On barley, yep, everything was performing better in protectant scenarios. Uh, and I think um, protheoconazole and floxoparoxide clearly both very active in both rinkosporium and net blotch. Um, and methen trifluconazole adding efficacy on, on ramularia. Uh, and I think we're seeing those two SDHIs, fluoropyrum and bixofen, really adding on net blotch, particularly in curative situations, and that's very useful. Moving on to the look at oilseed rape, we had four sites looking at oilseed rape last year, um, looking at FOMA, two sites on FOMA, two, two on light leaf spot, um, and testing those on varieties susceptible to those uh, pathogens. Again, a list of products, uh, many of, I'm sure, of which you're already familiar with, but perhaps a couple in here you're less familiar with. Um, right in the middle, we have Architect and Shepherd. I don't know how many people will have heard of those names. Um, they've only just been registered, so you can be forgiven for not having heard of them, um, both from BASF, and both involve Paraclostrobin. They've got Paraclostrobin into, into oil seed rape. Uh, we've known it previously in, in cereals as Comet, uh, but it's now in here uh, as an oilseed rape fungicide. In Architect, it's in with Mepiquot chloride and prohexidium calcium. That is actually the active ingredients of Canopy, the growth regulator used in wheat. Uh, and it's thought to have a level of growth regulatory activity in oilseed rape as well. So it's kind of a fungicide come growth regulator. Shepherd is in combination with boscolid, or boscolid we know is felan, that's been around for some time, uh, and um, a useful combination of two different active ingredients. Just to give a little bit more detail on those two, uh, Shepherd on the left has a full label rate of 0.8, and actually that's the total dose you can apply to the crop as well. Um, and it actually contains, in a full label rate, you're getting 200 grams of protheoconazole and uh, 0.8 of one, that's about a half label rate of felan in a full dose of uh, shepherd there. So it's paraclostrobin with a half dose felan effectively is how you can see that. Architect, again, it's got the prohexadione calcium nepiquot chloride um, and it's also got in a full label rate of it 200 grams of paraclostrobin, so quite comparable in, in dose of paraclostrobin in a full dose of it. You can go to a higher, you can go uh, to four litres, you can, you can apply it twice in, in Architect. But look at the label for more information on that, that'll give you uh, more of what you need to know. Looking at some of the data, we've got yield on the right and uh, disease control on the left here. Um, this is just looking at the FOMA. Uh, this is actually from Herefordshire, but the Norfolk site showed an almost identical response. Um, and again, on FOMA, ProLine is a good leveller. How did that perform? Well, the light blue line shows a very good performance from protheoconazole, uh, providing around um, all the control you could want, around 50% dose. Um, note the doses here run from 0 to 100%. We actually apply each product twice within the oilseed rape trials. We found that's a better way of getting disease and yield data out of the oilseed rape trials. Um, and so that's a slight variation from what we do in, in wheat and barley. Compared to ProLine, though, we have Aviator. Again, that's adding the Bixofen to Protheoconazole. And clearly that Bixofen seems to be adding a little bit more canker activity. Um, Shepherd, that mixture of um, Paraclostrobin and Bixofen, sorry, and, and Bosclid rather, um, sitting almost between the two. In terms of yield, I challenge anybody to really separate those yields. They're all providing something in the order of 0.3 of a ton yield response. 
uh, and the differences between them are nothing more than 0.1 or 0.2 of a ton. Looking over a wider period, um, this is actually, I think it's 2017 to 21, so it's like error in the slide there. But um, we have, we can compare a lot more products. I'm not going to try and describe every one of these. Again, I'll draw your eye to the light blue line of proteoconazole in the middle as the, as the point of comparison. And again, the yellow line of aviator there, a little bit below that, showing that bixofen is clearly adding to, to can stem canker control. Um, the two lines at the bottom are our shepherd and our architect. The uh, paraclostrobin-based treatment is coming out very well there. Uh, perhaps no surprise that the shepherd is slightly stronger in that shepherd contains the bosclid, uh, and bosclid is also known to have activity. Uh, we can see that in the uh, solo product Philan here, which is just straight bosclid that, that in itself has activity, so it's perhaps no surprise. In terms of yield response, some, some differences, and perhaps those three coming out best, the aviator uh, and two uh, paraclostrobin treatments, looking the strongest in terms of uh, fomosem canker. But quite small differences again, uh, and generally around about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of a ton is what we can expect uh, from foam control. Looking at light leaf spot now, um, again, we have yield on the, on the right and disease control on the left. It's actually quite hard to separate the products based on the uh, data that we get on the left. We can say that all those products are significantly reducing the light leaf spot compared to the untreated, uh, but it's probably quite hard to, to pull out the differences. What really matters in light leaf spot control is the yield response that we see. Uh, it's a tricky pathogen to actually assess. You have to incubate the plants and try and uh, assess just what visual symptoms you're getting from that. But when we look at yield responses to light leaf spot control, we get greater clarity in the data. Uh, and yes, actually Aviator and Shepherd coming out very, very well. Clearly again with Proline, we're seeing a slight step up in activity by the inclusion of that Bixofen in Aviator. And uh, when we look at um, light leaf spot over a longer time period now, uh, so the last three years, again, quite hard to separate based on the activity on the left-hand side. Um, Aviator and Proline both performing quite well over that period, but the mixtures, uh, Aviator and Shepherd, both coming out very, very well uh, when we look um, at the yields. Uh, and the yield response there, something approaching half a ton from those two sprays. Architect, we have actually got some data on light leaf spot on Architect. Uh, we tested it quite a long way back. It was back in 2015 and 16. Um, we looked at uh, this first, and we got five trials where we got quite good data comparing with Aviator and Proline. And if you recall in the last slide, Aviator was quite high on the, uh, in terms of yield and, and efficacy, it was looking very good. Uh, and actually, uh, Architect performing very similarly to it, uh, both in terms of disease control uh, and yield. Final slide on sclerotinia sclerot. You might wonder why we're including this because we haven't actually got trials at the moment looking at sclerotinia, but we have trials in the archive where we had coded products um, that were coded at the time but are now uh, product names. And we did actually have Shepherd uh, in uh, trials between 2015 and 17 and got some good data on sclerotinia. Um, when it comes to sclerotinia, there are two active ingredients that are really important. Proline and, and bosclid, or protheconazole and, and bosclid. Um, and any product containing those two actives tends to work quite well on sclerotinia. Both of the, well, sorry, all four of the lines in the bottom left hand corner of that graph, providing the highest level of control, contain <laughs> protheconazole uh, or bosclid. We have Phelan, Pictor, uh, Aviator, and um, Proline, all, all tucked away in there. Shepherd, containing around about a half dose of uh, bosclid in a full late dose of Shepherd, um, performing not quite as well, but not far away, perhaps reflecting the lower loading of, of, of bosclid in that product, but not far off the pace. So just to sum up on RC rate, I think on both, both FOMA and light leaf spot, we've got a range of different modes of action that are available to us. Um, on FOMA, we tend to see a yield response of about 0.3 of a ton. 
and generally little benefit applying more than around a 50% dose. So um, products can be, we can choose our, our, our rate um, appropriately there. In terms of differences between products, they tend to be quite small. Uh, and that's partly for the fact that, uh, you know, at quite low levels of canker incidence, we don't seem to see yield responses at all, just because the crop has a degree of tolerance of canker. It's only when we see quite high levels of canker do we actually see significant yield responses. On my leaf spot, we do think there are some isolates out there that have been shown in laboratory studies to be insensitive to azoles, and that's a concern. That said, we're not seeing significant changes in field performance, uh, which is reassuring. Um, that said, we've got different modes of action. We should use them. Uh, and so using azoles and non-azoles in sequence or in mixture is just really good practice and, and what we should be doing to, as part of the management, resistance management program. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging the other people in the fungicide working group that uh, make this project happen. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Jonathan, um, for sharing that information that really is fundamental to building our spray programs on farm. And that takes us really nicely on to the next presentation, um, where we're going to be thinking about how do we take this information forward and put it into practice? And what are the other factors that we need to think about alongside the use of that chemistry? So I'm really pleased to welcome our next speaker, Chloe Morgan, who's an arable crop pathologist at ADAS. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, so Jonathan's given us an update on efficacy of some of our key actives, and I'm going to discuss what I think are some key considerations that should be taken into account in putting these into a programme. So I'm going to look at sowing date, variety, the weather conditions, and the fungicide programme, using some examples uh, for winter wheat, but the same principles can be applied for other crops. So I'll start with sowing date. We know that early sowing will increase the risk of septoria in a crop. And we found this in a recent AHDB and BASF funded project for combining agronomy, variety and chemistry to maintain septoria triticide control in wheat. This is a five year project in which we carried out 25 different trials, looking at seed rate, sowing date, variety and fungicides for control of septoria. And we saw that in most of those trials, earliest sown plots, so in mid-September, had higher levels of septoria than mid-October. You can see that here in a drone photo taken from a trial in Herefordshire in 2019. Quite clearly, the plots sown in mid-October, in the top left there and bottom right, have got more green leaf area than the mid-September plots. And we use this data uh, to try and estimate the impact of sowing date on the resistance rating of a variety, try and help us to quantify that effect. And to do that, we use the same methodology that AHDB use to quantify differences between varieties to look at the difference between sowing dates. And that gave us this chart. So basically what we've got across the x-axis there, we've got the AHDB recommended list rating for a variety. And the y-axis is then our adjusted rating taking into account sowing date. So the recommended list at the time had used data from 2017 to 2020 which the average sowing date for that was the 7th of October. In our trials, the early sown plots averaged a sowing date of 22nd of September, and the late sown averaged the 20th of October. So quite neatly, they sit two weeks either side of your recommended list trials. If there's no effect of sowing date, then those three lines would all sit on that grey line, but there is a clear effect. So what this shows us, if we take a variety like Costello, rated 5.8 um, known for septoria on the recommended list. And we then sow that variety around the 22nd of September. It will act in the field actually more like a 5.2. On the other hand, if we sow that variety on the 20th of October, it will perform more like a 6.4. So effectively, a delay in sowing from the 22nd of September to the 20th of October is a uh, reducing our resistance, increased our resistance rating by 1.2. Now, obviously, it's a bit too late now to change the sowing date. Um, and it's also quite difficult sometimes to delay sowing due to the weather conditions. 
But hopefully what this will do is help you to take into account the impact of sowing date when it comes to looking at a fungicide programme. However, the opposite is actually true for yellow rust. So we see that later sowing will increase your risk of yellow rust in your crop. And so Pete Gladders did some work in 2007 looking at the different factors that influence yellow rust incidence in crops. And this is just a graph taken from his paper. You can see as we move from early September across to late November, the percentage of crops that are infected with yellow rust increases. And that's purely because an, a later sown crop will have plants in there that are always younger than an earlier sown crop. And for yellow rust, younger plants are more susceptible. Now we've had quite a kind autumn this year, um, so I know there are some crops that have gone in in November, so it'll be one to watch going forwards. My next consideration is variety, um, which is hugely important when it comes to looking at your fungicide programme. And I just want to remind you really that it's worth taking into account the yield response you can expect to achieve from a given variety. So all the recommended list data that goes into producing these scores on, on the recommended list is available on the AHDB website. So this graph here I've just produced by averaging the different um, figures across all of the trial sites for 2021. So you can see we've got all the varieties that are on the current recommended list. In blue there we've got the untreated yield and in orange the treated yield. So here I then pulled out the four varieties that saw the largest response to fungicides in terms of yield. And those are Wolverine, Skyfall, Zayat, Spotlight and Kerin, all achieving over three tonnes per hectare with the addition of fungicides. And it's no surprise really that these varieties are all known to be susceptible to yellow rust. Yellow rust comes in early in the season and it has quite a short life cycle, so it can very quickly start to degrade that green leaf area. So where you're using varieties that are higher risk for yellow rust in high risk situations, it's clearly worth spending a bit more on these varieties to make sure you're protecting that yield. At the other end of the scale, however, we've now got quite a few varieties which have strong resistance profiles against disease. So the four varieties in this list that had the smallest response to fungicides were Mayflower, Palladium, Theodore and Xdays, all of which were giving you up to a tonne per hectare with the addition of fungicides. So clearly in variety like these, you've got a much lower risk of yield loss from disease. So you can afford to lower your fungicide inputs and reduce your spend a bit because you're going to get less return from fungicides in these varieties. The weather conditions. Now, weather conditions have quite a big impact on all parts of, of crop growing crops um, and they influence our disease levels each season. Unfortunately, I can't predict what the weather will be like for 2021. I think I'd be quite popular if I could. Um, so I'm going to use 2021 as an example. This year, we saw that temperatures in April and May were about 0.5 to 2.5 degrees colder than the long-term average. Now, what that means for pathogens is it slows everything down. It takes longer to get into the crop and establish and then to develop. Especially for yellow rust, it likes nice warm, mild temperatures in the spring and frost in April would have reduced the risk of yellow rust. In terms of rainfall, we saw very low rainfall in April. So here you can see the Met Office charts comparing our rainfall in 2021 to the long-term average. On the left there is April, most of the country there in brown, with the dark brown areas receiving only 20% of the long-term average. So really dry conditions. This meant for rain splash dispersed pathogens like Septoria, once we saw it in the crop, come into the crop over the winter, it didn't really move up the crop. It stayed on those lower leaf levels and crops looked quite clean coming towards T1. As a result, I think there was an opportunity at T1 to lower your inputs, particularly in resistant varieties, because crops were looking clean and it had been so dry. In contrast, though, we saw very high levels of rainfall in May. The dark blue areas on this chart are receiving 200% of their average rainfall. So really wet conditions. And to me, this immediately rings alarm bells because we know that rainfall for Septoria will splash that rain up the crop onto those top three newly emerged yield forming leaves. So to me, I think it's a bit of a no brainer at T2 to go higher input. Although crops did look clean at the time, there was definitely going to be some Septoria bubbling away in the background 
that was going to emerge later on and cause us an issue. So I've just discussed that it's useful to take into account your sowing date, your variety and the weather conditions when it comes to thinking about your fungicide programme. And that's exactly what we asked six monitor farm groups to do this year in the ADAS and AHDB monitor farm fungicide wheat margin challenge. Hopefully most of you are aware of this project. Uh, we've been running it for the last three years. And this year we had six replicated plot trials, which were east hosted by members of the AHDB monitor farm groups um, in a commercial crop of wheat. So how this works is we set up a plot trial in each of their fields. The plots all receive the same inputs except for the fungicide. So we're just changing the fungicide application on those plots. Each trial is made up of a number of entrants, uh, most of which are from the local monitor farm group, but we've also got some from the wider industry. And it's the entrants to get assigned some plots that they then design the fungicide program on. They do this based on information on the crop at the start of the season and updates during the season on the crop's progress and disease levels. And they then decide their program a week before each application is due so they can take into account the season. The aim being to achieve the highest margin of a fungicide cost. So I haven't got long enough to go through all the results from this project. Um, so I'm just going to sort of highlight some of the key results that we saw this year. This chart here shows a bar for each of the six sites. So we had Sundance in the southwest. Graham in the northwest and Wales and west, Gleam in the East Midlands, Park in the northeast, and Skyfall in East Anglia. And the green bars there represent the average yield response to fungicides across all of the entrants in each of the trials. You can see the smallest yield response was in Sundance down in the southwest, with about 0.6 tonnes per hectare. This variety is fairly resistant to most failure pathogens. But unfortunately, we also had some lodging in this trial, which I think has capped the yield response. The biggest yield responses were in Parkin and Skyfall. Um, Parkin, if you're not familiar with it, is a variety that was developed to replace Grafton. It was tested in trials and recommended list in 2019. Um, and at that time, it was rated to 5.5 for Septoria and 9 for Yellow Rust. So because it's quite susceptible to Septoria, we saw a big yield response to fungicides of about 2.2 uh, 2 tonnes per hectare. And then the Skyfall equally, it's rated three for yellow rust, located in the east of Anglia. It's going to be a high rust risk situation for yellow rust, and therefore there's a bigger yield response. So no surprises there, really. We saw bigger yield responses in the higher risk situations. I've now added to that chart a black bar, which shows the range in yield responses that we saw across all of the different treatments in each trial. And you can see for most of those trials, there is quite a big big range um, in the yield response that each entrant achieved. So I think this, what it shows is that it's quite important to think carefully about your program and which products you choose to make sure you're getting the most out of them. And then finally to that graph, I've added an orange spot there, which represents the yield response for the program that achieved the highest margin in each of those trials. And you can see actually in most cases this year, the yield response there is one of the highest in each of those trials. I think that's down to the season. We saw higher disease levels than we have in the, the previous two years. And so in this case, it was worth using fungicides to protect that yield. So I'm just gonna run through uh, two examples of the winning programs in two of the trials. Um, the first one is in the Northeast, which was the parking. So this was sown on the 20th of October. And the main disease that we saw in this trial was Septoria although some low levels of yellow rust came in towards the end of the season. In this case, the winning program left their T-naught untreated as disease levels were low at the time. They used a T1 of Aspera and Phoenix, a high rate of Unirocket T2, and then a T3 of Pissarro and Legend. So because this was a high risk situation, um, this is a fairly robust program with a higher spend of 115 pounds. But in this case, it paid off. In contrast to that, we have the Wales and West. So this was Graham, slightly more resistant variety for Septoria with a 6.7. Similar sowing date of the 16th of October. And again, the dominant disease in this trial was Septoria. And this trial, the entrant that had the winning programme 
did use a team of legend, which is tebuconazole, just to protect against the risk of yellow rust, although we didn't actually see any in this trial. Because they're in a fairly resistant variety and it had been very dry in April, the T1 there is pretty low input uh, with just legend and Arizona. So quite a protectant program that will protect against yellow rust and septoria going forwards. Given the amount of rainfall in May, they went for a higher input T2 with Revistar at 0.8 in Arizona and a fairly robust T3 of Presario and Uzip Gold. So because it was in a more resistant variety, they were able to tailor it back a bit by taking into account the season. The spend on fungicides was lower in this case at £77 and helped them to achieve the highest margin in this trial. So just to summarise really all the six trials um, from this series, we saw higher disease pressure in 2021, and as a result, the moderate to high spend in fungicides tended to achieve the highest margins in each case. We did see that multi-sites were a valuable addition to the programme. In five out of six of the trials, there was a multi-site in the winning programme. But I know a lot of people are still sort of on the fence about whether it's worth including a multi-site. Well, clearly it's not doing any harm, and I know it will, it will give an impact, um, particularly in high-risk septoria situations. It's also going to be good for resistance management. And finally, what I think I've learned over the last three years of doing this project um, is that no one knows the farm and the field as well as you do. So you know what sort of yield you can expect from that field, and you know what sort of yield response you can get. And that yield response is quite important in determining how much you spend. Obviously, a sandy soil that's in the east of the UK that droughts out most seasons, you're going to see a much smaller yield response to fungicides than in a heavy clay soil in the west of the UK that's got lots of nutrients where fungicides are going to be able to maintain that green leaf area. So if you'd like to test a fungicide programme in a replicated plot trial, um, then do get in touch with either myself at ADAS or your local AHDB Knowledge Exchange Manager, and we'll see what we can do. So those are my key considerations for disease control. Using sowing date, variety and weather conditions to alter your fungicide programme and hopefully reduce inputs where appropriate. In doing so, you'll be able to reduce your impact on the environment, reduce the risk of resistance development, and hopefully maximise your margins. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chloe. Um, Jonathan, if I can invite you back onto the stage. Thank you. So just a reminder, if you've got any questions for any of our speakers today, if you can use polyv.com forward slash hdb to put those questions to them. You can see that we've got some coming in. I've already got an arrangement with Jonathan and Chloe. If there's words that I can't pronounce, they're going to have to read them out for me. <laughs> so um, I think some of these might have come in from my uh, colleague Richard just to catch me out. Um, but let's start with the top one then. How does Folpet improve ramularia control? Uh, Folpet does have uh, some activity on ramularia. It's not always, um, it doesn't always give a very consistent response. Uh, but it does seem to have some activity on ramularia. It's not going to give the same level of activity as uh, Bravo or Chlorothanol did previously, though, uh, but it may help. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the next question, oh, goodness. Can you comment on the EG50 values of prothioconazole and methentrifluconazole? Did I get that right? Near enough. Um, activity against septoria in the UK over the past four seasons. Is there a real shift in fungicide sensitivity that should be reflected in product choice at T2 in winter wheat? I'd have to check to see how it's changed over the last four seasons, but certainly over the last 15 or 20 seasons, we've seen a real change in the nearly 50 value of protheoconazole. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's become less sensitive over time in laboratory studies. Um, Mephentrifluconazole, it's perhaps too early to say um, because it's only been out there a couple of years. We haven't really got enough data out there to show just how that's been selected for, if it's been selected for at all yet. What was the last part of that? Is there a real shift in fungicide sensitivity that should be reflected in product choice at T2 and winter wheat? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think... It's a difficult one here because every product mixture that we've got out there generally contains one partner that it is not performing as well and has been selected for and showing a degree of uh, resistance in the population uh, or populations that are out there. 
Um, really, we should be looking at mixtures that contain leading actives that are the most effective, so that they're each protecting each other. And that isn't really what we're doing at the moment with, with Univoc, because Protheoconazole isn't performing as well as the partner. Uh, but it's also the same with Revistar, in that um, equally, it's not performing uh, as well. And my research is performing much better than the, 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 the Floxapyroxide that's in there. So really what we should be doing is mixing the Mephentrifluconazole with the uh, Fenpicoximid, the two new actives, uh, and that would probably give us more uh, resilient resistance management. Brilliant, thank you. Leading on from that, and a uh, question for you, Chloe, I think. You mentioned lots of different factors in, in your presentation. What do you think is the single most important factor with regards to resistance management? I think I'd put it down to variety still being key and using variety to protect chemistry and the chemistry to protect the variety, using them together in an integrated approach and will hopefully help to yeah, build resilience in both. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got a question here. I noticed that in all the diseases mentioned that the 50% dose, the, sorry, the 50% dose rate was almost as good as the full label rate. Is there any risk of building resistance by using the lower rate? Jonathan, if I come to you first. Actually, it's a, it's a misunderstanding there, I think, that lower doses increases the chance of selection for insensitivity. It doesn't in serial diseases. It tends to work the other way. The more fungicide we apply, the more we select for insensitivity to that fungicide. Um, so actually, no, you're not increasing the risk of resistance occurring by applying less. You're actually doing yourself a failure, you're improving the situation by applying less. You're Brilliant. selecting less. Um, and Chloe, you just mentioned varieties, so I'll come to you. It seems untreated yield falls as varieties age. How should we be looking after new varieties with low responses to fungicides to prevent breakdown of their disease scores over time? Yeah, so resistance does develop over time due to the there's a number of minor genes that build up that resistance. Um, and as this pathogen start to gradually overcome a number of those. Um, so inceptory does tend to be quite slow, but I think again it's it's using reducing your inputs in these sort of varieties because you've got a lower untreated yield, you can sorry, high untreated yield, you can reduce your inputs, but still applying enough to protect the chem to protect the variety. Um, yeah, as obviously fungicides are applied for a relatively short amount of time in the season, just from April to sort of May, June, July. Um, so yeah, just helping the variety a bit from during that period. Great. Um, so I think question for you, Jonathan. You mentioned historically that Revisol outperformed against Inatrek, but in more recent years they perform more alike. Do you think that's due to a drop in performance of Revisol and that we'll see a similar decline in following seasons? That's a good question. Uh, the problem with both those products is they've, they've both got other components which also are changing in their efficacy, so it's almost impossible to predict uh, at this point with the, the level of uh, data that we have. Um, and exactly how it changes from here will depend on how each of those components um, selects for insensitivity and how populations of septoria change in the next year or two. Uh, and I'm afraid it's impossible to predict. Okay, and um, what's the best way of looking after new actives? The best way of looking after new yeah. actives? Um, oof. Okay. Um, to apply them uh, only where we need them in a mixture with other actives that are similarly effective on the pathogen in target. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And I did just see um, another question, but I think that leads us nicely on to our next session. There was a question around the RL and being the cornerstone of, um, of fungicide use and IPM. So I think we'll leave that there. If you can join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.